We have shout outs. Wow. Mike, uh, I'm giving I'm going to give a shout out to O'Neill. Okay, I'm from O'Neill. Those those are my peeps right there. Um, they said they're going to heckle me, so I'll just start with them. Um, so um, thank you for coming to this. Um, we are going to be connecting the dots and it's not kind of like the dot to dot that you give to your kiddos after school. It's a little bit more involved. Um, I am going to uh, welcome you for this. Thank you for engaging in what this is going to be a interactive activity. Um, for those of you at home we'll, or at school, we will also be putting you into breakout rooms and trying to um, help you with that as well. So um, my name is Monica Huber. Uh, again, I'm from O'Neill, the Irish capital of Nebraska. I am not one bit Irish. So I didn't go, except for the curls, I, I was an Irish dancer, but we won't go into that. Um, and I am uh, with uh, NCFL and the Nebraska Statewide Family Engagement Center. And I am the Ready Rosie project manager. So um, if anybody is interested in Ready Rosie that has not already come to talk to me, I would love to talk to you about what that looks like for your kiddos and your families. Um, I'm gonna introduce my, my cohorts here. Um, this is Hannah and Lisa. Give them a shout out. Woo! They are the other members of the team. We are missing one, Jessica. Um, she is flying to Italy. I mean, come on, that's, <laughs> this is so much better, right? Um, yeah, so um, yes, yeah, so Lisa and Hannah, Lisa and Hannah work together a lot. Um, they're gonna go over, um, can we move our, they're gonna go over um, more of, what the Nebraska Statewide Family Engagement Center does, what it looks like, um, and how you can be involved if you're not already. Um, we're gonna go over the key initiatives that we have um, within our company. And um, the most important thing while you're here is that asset mapping, uh, because we tend to forget about those relationships that we have in our communities, big or small, that we could be utilizing um, to help our programs and help our families and our, our schools engage with, with the community. So with that, dun, 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 it's Hannah. <laughs> Thank you. So yes, as Monica said, my name is Hannah. I'm a family literacy training specialist with the National Center for Families Learning and the Nebraska Statewide Family Engagement Center. My primary role, is coaching and supporting all of our family literacy sites across Nebraska as they're implementing their programs. So before we get into the bulk of what we're doing today, we just wanted to give you a little bit of background and context about who we are and what we do. So the Nebraska Statewide Family Engagement Center, we are, as you can see, there are 12 different states that were awarded the SFEC grant in 2018. It is a five-year grant and we are just entering our fifth year right now this year. So we're very excited about that. Um, we are one of two states through NCFL, the National Center for Families Learning that do the, they're sponsored by NCFL. That is us, Nebraska and Arizona is the other state that we partner with through NCFL. Our main purpose is establishing and implementing high impact family literacy engagement efforts and really building that statewide network through family literacy programming. This one. So our, a few of our Nebraska SFEC partners, first and foremost, are those family literacy programs in those districts that we are currently working with. We have all of them listed here and to show where we are across the state. And aside from our family literacy programs and our school districts, we work with the Nebraska Department of Education. They were some of the ones that signed off on the SFEC grant to work with us, and they have been a huge, huge support in expanding this work, giving us recommendations about who to reach out to to expand this work. Nebraska Children and Families Foundation, NCFF, has been another wonderful partner of ours, as well as Unite for Literacy, which we'll kind of talk about both of those partners as we go. Who can tell me how many schools are in that she just talked about? How many schools do we have? Who said that? 
right. I'm ready. Starbucks gift card. <laughs> Yeah, keep your eyes and ears ready. <laughs> we snuck that one in, but pay attention. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we just expanded to, for our fifth year, two new districts that were represented on there, Beatrice and Hastings. So we are very excited to be in those communities and continue expanding this work. So a few of our key initiatives, of course, we've talked about family literacy. We're going to talk about that four component model in just a little bit. Professional development, we gave an example over here of the webinars that NCFL is able to provide all across the country. These are open to our family literacy practitioners, teachers, administrators, anyone in the community that wants to engage um, through those webinars. This is an example of one of the ones that we provided last year. Monthly PLCs, this is a huge connector with our family literacy sites. We provide these on a monthly basis virtually for our family literacy programs just to connect. We go over different topics and themes, sometimes have guest speakers come and join us just about different topics that we have heard from our family literacy programs that they want to learn more about. And it is their time to just form that community, ask questions, answer questions, and have that community of support. Book distribution, this goes back to our partner on the previous slide, Unite for Literacy, also another partner in our grant. Families participating in family literacy and through those districts can register and sign up for a book distribution where they get a sample book packet or a book packet that has five books inside. They get that for 25 weeks and so they end with 100 books in their home. Quarterly Nebraska Cafe. This is also a partnership with the Nebraska Department of Education where community members, practitioners, and parents, most importantly, this is that connector for parents to come together and just be a part of a community where they can address things, worries, concerns, things are exciting to them that they wanna learn more about and just connect with other families. And a quarterly advisory board meetings, these are made up of 50% parents in our uh, Nebraska community, more community practitioners, family literacy practitioners as well. Thank you. And now I will pass this to Lisa. Okay, I'm going to talk to you. Well, first, whatever Hannah said about her job, that's me, but my name's Lisa, not Hannah. <laughs> So I'm gonna to talk to you about what is family literacy. Family literacy is a four component model that begins with children's education at the school district, as well as childcare provided by some entities for parents be, to be able to have access. Packed time, which is a trademarked, stands for parent and child together time, where parents get to go into their child's classroom to learn alongside them, to understand what that atmosphere is like. Parent time, where we provide information about the community, child development, um, anything that families need to be able to increase their social capital, and then adult education. And most of our families are working on either adult ELL, GED, or work workforce development, <clears throat> excuse me, um, to increase their economic capital. So I'm going to talk to you about children's education and what family, what asset mapping looks like for us in family literacy. So families learn about the programs and resources available to their children. And they engage family, we engage families in actively choosing what their child will, put, will participate in. Now that could be SPED services within their school. That could be after school programming. That could be YMCA programming. And we're going to restart. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. <laughs> okay. And so um, making them aware of what those resources are and understanding the choices that they have for that. So for asset mapping in pack time, that parent and child together time. This is, as Lisa said, where the parenting adult gets to come to the school into the child's classroom for at least one hour a week. But of course, during the pandemic, there were a lot of barriers to that when families could not physically come into the schools and pack time was taking place outside of the classroom. And so we saw a need through, and we did this through asset mapping to figure out how parents could still be connected to their children's education outside of the classroom during that time. 
So through some of this, we saw sharing resources for family activities outside of the classroom. And we did that in partnership with Nebraska Children and Families Foundation through Beyond School Bells program, as well as the UNL 4-H extension office to create STEM backpacks. Lisa is holding up an example of how we did that. So families have been able to get these in their home. There are over, I think there are 10 to 12 themes now, STEM themes, where families can get a backpack. It has that literacy aspect. These are bilingual kids in English and Spanish with books so that they can engage in that reading. And then they do an activity based off of that STEM activity. And then they can swap to get a new theme so that they're you know, exposed to different activities, different themes through books. So that was just an example through our own asset mapping, thinking about our partners in the community. And this was really based off of what parents want. Um, there was a program that piloted these kits and we improved them based off of what the family said and their recommendations for what they wanted to see in these kits so that we could continue them and bring them into other communities. And then also parents inquiring, acquiring the knowledge to plan and facilitate their family's involvement with community resources, engage in different activities beyond the classroom and take that knowledge that they learn maybe through these activities or inside the classroom, take that beyond. Excellent, Anna. Okay, does anybody remember um, what PAC time stands for? She, she, she rolls her hand, say it again. Parent and child. All right, all right, we'll give it to skills. Okay, it's gonna be more, it's gonna be more. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about parent time. Um, this is one of my favorite parts. And I have to tell you, um, I do Ready Rosie, but I, I started in family literacy with being in the program at O'Neill schools. It, we implemented, uh, we began our implementation last year. So it's been one year since we've been in that. Um, so I am an adult educator and I do parent time. Um, so parent time is one of my favorite and, and it's, this program guys is designed for your parents to lead it. It's directed by these parents and families. We are just guides to help them get through that process, but really this is their program. They drive it. It's their questions, what their needs are, what their goals are. So helping them find those assets to complete that is what we do. So parent time, um, we, we survey the parents and we ask, what is it, what's a burning question that you have for your community, in our community, for, for example, in O'Neill? Um, what are you wanting to learn? What are you not what resources do you wish you knew about that are here in this community? Um, and so we bring in people based on their questions, what they're looking to do. Um, for instance, in O'Neill, we, um, we, we had a couple of nurses who were nurses in Mexico, um, the, which they are not here. Um, and they, we have several nursing homes there. We have a nursing home and some assisted livings. Um, we brought in the directors from those uh, facilities to talk about that partnership that they could have with us to help those parents, those specific people um, find employment within the facility while still working on getting um, their citizenship or moving their degrees over so they're compatible. So that's one thing. Um, we actually had a lot of the, the parents and families interested in entrepreneurship, opening businesses in our community and not knowing how to do that, um, if not being from this country. So we brought in some attorneys from UNL um, who helped with migrant, um, with migrant people and the different laws that can affect um, that area. Um, and they came in and talked to us. And so the really cool thing about that is that we are starting a community cafe in O'Neill that the parents are going to be driving and involved to help other people with voices at the city council and voices at the school board and, and everywhere that they need to be, giving them that, that voice and that position. So that's the asset mapping that I, I love with parent time. And then it's also very simple. It could be, I don't know how to get my kids to sit down for supper. <laughs> I don't know how to do 
something better, healthier, that's not going to take me an hour and my kids are lost. So just bringing in a, a, a health a nutritionist from our area hospital and talking about here's a simple, easy, quick, healthy dinner. And then this is how we're going to sit down and model that with them. So it's any, any kind of topic with people who have want banking information, just how to cook something or something as big as um, advocating for themselves legally. Um, that's what parent time is. And we do that once a week um, or more if we need to. And, and we just kind of sit down and talk about everything together and what it looks like from each perspective. So. Thank you. <clears throat> so when we talk about asset mapping, when it comes to adult education, there can be a lot of different ways that that looks. I taught for Lincoln Public Schools for 13 years within family literacy. I didn't work for a community college. I came from an early childhood education background, but I became the adult educator. That was that asset mapping to find someone with a skill. Um, but some places use adult community ed partners. Some places use literacy partners. Look around and see what exists within your community. And then finding a meeting space for a classroom outside of a school. Um, if you are in a school that has not enough space for the students you currently have, could you raise your hand? Yeah. So when you're in that situation and you're looking at, well, we would like to have family literacy, where are you going to put them? <laughs> so start to looking at what are the community resources around you? Is it a church? Is it a YMCA? Is it a community group that has space without people in it at the time of day that you're looking for? Any questions before I, um, I'll move that back. Any questions about family literacy before I move on? Okay, we could talk about it for a long time. We're really passionate. Okay, <clears throat> so what is asset mapping? It is simply that systematic process of cataloging what exists within your community, key services, benefits, and those resources. Um, individual skill sets, physical space, institutions, associations, whatever. There is a definition on your handout. Um, it is pretty bare bones. This definition came from the Rural Health Info Initiative. I, I liked it better. I think it gives a little more information than um, what you have. So we're going to talk about some examples. So I'll start off with an example of a larger community, because we know communities do not look the same in their size, their people, services they offer, it is so different. So for larger communities and asset mapping, it's not only you know, thinking about that what is accessible, what is available, but what is also accessible. So an example for a larger community, maybe like Omaha, that's where I currently live, key services that maybe transportation, that public transportation in those larger communities that might not be available in smaller ones, more opportunities, you know, maybe for community partners, of course, that comes with those community partners, they might provide more specific opportunities, but those are just a few examples from larger communities. Medium small. I represent small. Um, so, so um, in a small rural community, which a lot of us are, we have 3,700 in O'Neill. Anybody smaller than that in here? What do you guys? Oh, okay. Yeah. So Broken Bow, she's like 2,600. So it's going to look a little different um, than it does in Omaha um, and Lincoln and, and anywhere in between. Um, so it's it takes some creativity to think about what those assets are, um, those key assets in, our, in your small communities. So for us, you know, um, it's, it's finding the Chamber of Commerce who can reach out to all of the businesses that are in our little community and talk about the services that they provide after school in the summertime um what like some um summer meals at the school getting that information out to parents who who don't know all of the information um we have a radio station there that is pretty much been the same since i was born um and that's where a lot of information goes. But some of our families, they don't they don't listen to the radio. Um, it's not that's but that's where they they provide that information. So it's getting 
um, those key services connected with what you're doing. And on a side note for this, even though you, you're not, if you're not involved in family literacy, this is not where you don't have this in your school. This doesn't exclude you from trying all of these things. So, um, you know, it's very important to engage our community with our school, with our families and make that triangle um, connect all the time. So um, another thing I would say in a small community um, is just going to those people that the, own the grocery store. We have the same family that's on the grocery store forever. Seeing what they would be willing to do. There could be a mentor program, having kids come in and see what it looks like to um, run a grocery store or anything anything at all that you have in this community, um, you just start to start thinking and brainstorming of who could be um, a partner with you guys. You ready? No? Okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about um, in our, in many probably in your communities have unused space, underutilized spaces, which means empty warehouses, empty buildings, something that has shut down. And there's a lot of those that have happened with the pandemic, a lot. Um, and so getting with your community leaders, your city council, like in our community, it would just be our mayor and our city council and, and the people we sit by in church because everybody is everywhere. Um, and talking about, hey, that building that's empty, that's been empty, the bowling alley that's closed, what can we do about that to provide more opportunities for our families in this community? How can we partner with you? How can we get this going um, to make it accessible to our families and the community and so everybody's a partner? Um, overlooked skills. There are so many people in, in your communities that are doing something that they never thought they were gonna be doing, like, <laughs> like myself, um, no. um, you know, so there are skills everywhere and talents everywhere, cooking, financial options, um, literacy, mentoring, whatever. It, I think about in our community, our, our farmers, um, what a great opportunity. We had a, a, a parents with a, a child who's going into eighth grade and they asked me, what can my kid do this summer? I don't want him to be on, my, on the iPad because there's not a lot to do in, in, a, in our community. Um, connecting them with a couple of the farmers and ranchers that we had so they can learn, that child could go and learn what it looks like to work on a farm, why, the, why they do what they do, where the food goes. Does it go to the local grocery store? Does it get shipped out? And just some work, some work ethic. And so building those relationships so then that child is going to go back next year and the next year to work on this farm and they are willing to have more kids, more people come and see what, what that looks like, um, just for another example. So overlooked skills. There are people that need help and they need to teach and they want to teach, but they don't know how to connect it. So it's kind of our job to try to connect that. Um, obviously, when you um, connect people and show them, give them that they, they have the confidence to do something, that they are um, proud of something, it just builds positive positivity through across the board. I, use, I like to use real examples. My daughters who are 15 and 13, please pray for me. Um, <laughs> We talk, thank you. We talk a lot about uh, it's hard to be a teenager in school and all these different things and this, all this digital and all that we already know. But we talk about making lists. My, my youngest said, I want to be recognized by the teachers more for my academics. She's very quiet. And so we talk about making lists. What are my attributes? What do I want for myself? Who do I want to be? What makes me proud? What would not make me proud? And so that is the kind of thing that I suggest for all of us to help guide our families and, and yourselves to say, okay, what, what would increase pride in my families? 
what would increase pride for me in my community and these relationships? I want ownership. I want to be able to speak at the school board meeting and say, I don't like this program. I want more transparency, you know, be there. Those types of situations. So make lists, attributes, what you're proud of, what you want to be recognized for. Um, work together to strategize, to build on the existing resources you have. Because remember, you already have some resources, you have us. And you have people in your community that support you. And you have parents that support you. So utilize those, see, see what, what else they can do um, and how you can work to increase your reach within the community. Um, and then existing resources and new places and new ways. We have an empty theater in O'Neill. Um, you know, my hope is that we could open that back up with the city's help and, and make it something where, where we can bring kids and families in to watch something that is very helpful, or we could even have a community project and tear it down and, and build it back up. You know, it doesn't matter. Put your, set your sights on a goal and try to try to accomplish that. So we good. Yes. So that leads us into the who, as Monica was saying, building those relationships, expanding your reach, figuring out who that is, who you can partner with, where, what spaces you can utilize. And that asset mapping team includes that cross section of so many different people and community partners, like the school, business leaders, parents, young professionals, students, retirees of the neighborhood, and really any member of the population you serve. We've talked a lot about you know, who we've served from our programs, but we'd like to hear just a little bit about who your population is and who you serve. So we'd like to open that up just to get a little bit of an understanding of the populations that you serve. Hello, um, I'll start. Uh, my name is Rob Valentine. Um, I am the interim director over at Florence Boys and Girls Club. Um, I, I've been to a lot of different Boys and Girls Clubs. So um, I've served a lot of different communities. Uh, right now, uh, our, our community is very diverse to where we have um, you know, Black, White, um, Asian, um, all different kinds. So. Um, the one I was at previously, uh, Omaha South Boys and Girls Club, to where I was uh, serving, you know, uh, Mexican, uh, Spanish, um, just different kinds. So I, I think my background is well diverse as far as communities served, um, and it's very diverse at the current club that I'm at right now. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Carly. I'm a school community coordinator in Lincoln at an elementary school. We're right in the middle of town, kind of where the more poverty ridden side meets the not as poverty ridden side. So kind of right in the middle, which is kind of an interesting place to be. But one thing that our neighborhood found was that we didn't have a very good, sorry. We didn't have very good scores in um, prenatal care um, for families. So that's one thing that, and this was even before I started that they really wanted to focus on. So we had an event where we kind of brought those services in. So that's kind of a unique thing about our community. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm, I'm going to share an example. I'm, I was a family literacy coordinator at a Lincoln school and um, our CLC that we worked with did a, an asset mapping and it included uh, a third grade student, a fourth grade student and a fifth grade student on our asset mapping team. Fifth grade is as high as we went. And as we were doing that asset mapping, it came out from one of our students that we had a teacher who did jump rope tricks. <laughs> nobody knew except some of the kids who had seen her at recess and so that became a club and a club we would never would have offered wouldn't have known about had we not included our third fourth and fifth grade students on our asset mapping team it was with a mix it was adults students school personnel members of our snack committee 
Okay, and so Arnold, the awesome Miss Dana. Okay, so when? Oh, yes, please go ahead. I'll back up. Is that me? Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Harun Al Haider. I'm the CLC community coordinator of our Lincoln High School. Um, the, peer, the, the communities that we serve is, is pretty diverse. We have communities from the immigrant communities like Kern, we have uh, Middle Eastern communities, uh, Hispanic, uh, uh, Spanish, and also we have Ukrainian, Afga uh, like Afghani community. We, we are pretty diverse. And we just started a family literacy program, actually, uh, learning English classes. But um, so we just started. So I would be curious to learn a little bit about how do you recruit those families so we can uh, reach out to those families and maybe uh, get more uh, parents to get involved in this program. It's free. Yes, um, Haroon, if you will reach out to Monica Asher within the district there, um, she will connect you with me. I am Lincoln's coach, and I would be glad to talk with you about that. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else before we move to the next slide? One back here. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Amelia Marie, uh, they, she, and I work with the honor students at University of Nebraska Lincoln. So uh, we match the college students to after school programs. Um, and these primary, yeah, like, yeah, they're super awesome. I am super excited to be working with so many sites. Um, our, our students really come from a large amount of backgrounds. Either I find that they are interested in getting involved in the community because they're not from Lincoln um, and they don't know what's gonna be at the school. I'm getting a lot more first years involved um, and they're really excited and intrigued about uh, Lincoln and what it has to offer. They're surprised by the diversity. Thank you. And every CLC in here thanks you for your work. <laughs> okay, so when? When should we asset map? And my answer is early and often, okay? Um, as soon as you start a program, as soon as you're aware that you do not have a current asset map, you should be working on that. And as we all know, resources come and go, things close, funding goes away. Anybody here receiving some form of ESSER funding? Mm -hmm. Anybody think it's gonna last us 10 years? <laughs> No, <laughs> we all know better, right? So those resources come and go. So we have to review that asset map. I would suggest at least yearly, okay? Um, but if you find something's gone that you have relied on in the past, you might want to do some asset mapping around a particular area on that, okay? Um, we are going to divide you into some work groups for those who are, oh, I'm yeah. so sorry, I lied. I just hopped right ahead. <laughs> well, not really, because this is the intro into what we're getting into next. We want to kind of get into that breakout to actually, you know, practice this and start thinking about this. And this is the how. We won't go through each of these. We will refer you to uh, your handout at the very, very bottom of this front page. It lists out all of these steps with a few example questions that you might want to think about as you're going through each of these steps with your asset mapping team. And the only thing that we will say or mention about some of these steps is once you have your team gathered and you're ready to start, it's a matter of taking your time with the process and trusting that process through each one of these steps. You know, we encourage you take time for each one, you know, not necessarily skipping a step, but really having fidelity to every single one of these steps and really thinking about each one of those questions and steps in that process, but now is our time to get into that process. So I will take it over to Lisa. All right, now this is me. Um, before we do that, uh, Miss Monica, there are 12 people on Zoom. Would you like one breakout group or two? Two. 
two. two. There's like your I answer. Okay, so now we're going to talk about our how in action. Um, our, I'm looking at our time here. Um, I think we've, we're good. If you are in a community of larger than 30,000, would you please stand up? Ooh, so we're going to have two groups here. Um, let's see if we can't have you and the two ladies back there, if you can join this table here. And then we're going to make Crete move here shortly. <laughs> and which school district are you with? Winnebago. Winnebago. Okay, so you yes, you will both be moving. You're not 30,000, are you? Okay, if you are in a community of 15 to 29,000, would you please stand? Yeah, we have a couple. We're gonna lower that down to 10,000. <laughs> We're gonna have you join this table right here. Um, if you are in a community of under 10,000, under 10,000, we're going to have you come join this table right up here. And then those online are just mixed. So Winnebago, you're going to come up here. I'm sorry, I should call you by your name, not your school district. Katie, would you please join us up here? <laughs> right here. Yep, perfect. Perfect, perfect. Awesome. Forgive us folks at home while we uh, move around, those at home and those in their school. Okay. Right over there. Over there. Yep. You know, um, we could, a couple people could slide in over here. It's, we're gonna be okay. We just didn't want to have, yep, that'll work. Yep, that will work. Awesome. Okay, so does everybody have their little one page handout? Great. Um, the reason we wanted you in communities that were close to the same size and the folks on Zoom, um, your moderator, Miss Monica, will be joining you here shortly. Um, the reason we wanted you to be in smaller groups with communities that were close to the same size was to be able to have some relevance to one another as you're thinking about those resources. So the first question that we want you to talk about as a group is who could we include in our asset map mapping group in our community? Then we want you to think about what resource categories might go on your asset map. If you look at yours um, within the asset mapping um, handout we gave you to start with on page two, there's an example with titles, um, but those titles may not fit your community. So we gave you a blank one to be thinking about how to categorize your resources. Okay. Um, then we want you to start brainstorming what those resources might be. And then the last thing we want you to do is to set a target date by which your group, your community, your program will have an asset map completed or reviewed, okay? Um, Hannah and I will be wandering around the room to help. And um, Miss Monica will be doing work with her group. I wanna give you guys just a little example like her jump rope before. Um, so in our community, you, you may not know all the assets. You may not even know. So my thought is just to start inviting people. And my thought is like a, a partners in the park situation. So invite your community leaders, your businesses, everybody comes. And then that way you can connect, network, um, families can be there, kids can be there. And you can figure out who those partners would really, who, who they would be, who can, who can be a part of that. Um, and see that engagement. So, you know, just start with inviting people. If you don't know off the top of your head who would be a good person to start, um, just think of everybody because, you know, everybody can be a partner in some way, shape, or form. Um, so I'll get let you get right in. 
All right. Okay. Um, and the last thing I would add is um, whether it would be in person or virtual, if you would like assistance in asset mapping or a moderator to help with that, please feel free to reach out to us.
Hello. Old teacher move. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Um, there's a lot of great discussion going around on the room, and I just want to add something that I think might serve well for some other communities from some of our smallest communities at the back table as we were talking, as they were talking, and I was eavesdropping, <clears throat> I heard them talking about the lack of, of large industry or businesses, and don't forget your local co-op board. That gets you access and your agricultural society that runs your county fair gets you access to some people in a group so that you don't have to go farm to farm to farm to talk to some of the largest farmers in your area. So um, thinking about where the people with the assets congregate and going there. So just as a just as a toss in comment that that might be applicable to several other more rural communities as well. Um, we are shockingly at our time. So I'm going to ask a quick question. Does anybody, did anybody hear something today that was very surprising or um, made you think about something in a new way? It has made me think about going back and working at our literacy program. Oh, we love you. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we'll make sure she knows. Yes, ma'am. So we also teach asset mapping, and it's really cool to see other ways of how people do it and organize it. and. Um, the way that we do it, it doesn't give like kind of some first steps and questions like this. And so it's really helpful to even see like a handout of things, because even at our table, we were talking about um, like the discussion from the things that we were writing down. And so it's really helpful to see another way of how to organize it. Perfect. Um, on the back table, and I'll before I give the microphone over, I have some children's books. I know programs that work with children never have enough books. So we have some children's books we'll put back here and our business cards are there as well. Please feel free to stop by and pick one up. I'm from Iowa, right across the border in Council Offs. And I guess this makes me wanna fight a little harder to get um, not cooperation, but more buy-in from Nebraska. Cause a lot of times, sometimes if I reach out, I hear, as soon as they hear Iowa, they're like, peace out. We can't help you. So. Awesome. And then Hannah, there was one more comment up there. And I'm sorry, I'm out of gifts. <laughs> well, we have t-shirts. Oh. I apologize. Oh, right here. Thank you. Okay, okay, oh gosh. Um, I think the one thing that like really made me think was the parent and children like time together. Um, as being only 19, I wish I had a lot more time with my parents when I was in elementary and middle school. And it just made me realize that like the kids, like since COVID happened, I realized that my mom's became a bigger part of my little brother's life. And yeah, COVID like sucks and it kind of ruined our whole world. But um, I think some good benefits came out of it too. Um, it really, I taught my brother like his English and his math and my mom taught his science because I suck at science and I think kids just need to be more connected with their parents and I think like us as like after school helpers or teachers I think we can really make a difference in the world, if we really try, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Table, and the last two speakers, feel free to go up and get a t-shirt. If they're, they're oh. all those t-shirts. They're all 2XLs. I know, they're, they're all 2XLs, but they're like nightgowns. <laughs> if there is any information or questions that you are having, feel free to reach out to us. Please take our contact. I'm going to put it up on the, we want to put our contact up on the slide. Please feel free to reach out to us. We will still be at our table outside for a little bit longer if you want to come visit us, if there's something that you want to connect on, we'll be there. Thank you.